Hi everybody, I'm Jim Skelly and this is the Global Conversation. Um, this is the eighth and final mini-lecture of uh, the fall semester in 2011. Um, it is, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, the agreement that uh, was just made in Durban, South Africa. Uh, but first I'd like to uh, thank all of you for your participation this semester. Uh, we now have uh, projects from 12 of the 14 learning circles, an extraordinary number of learning circles, I have to say. Um, there is always some difficulty that people have, either getting their files together or sending them to us or whatever it may be. But we really are very, very pleased with the uh, learning circle projects that you have created for this uh, semester. Um, you'll find them all on the uh, left-hand side of the home page for the course. I hope you'll take a look at them and comment on them. Uh, it's really, it's one of the best we've ever done. So you should all feel very proud about of your work and uh, the effort that you've put into it. So thanks again for all of that. And uh, um, I hope that if any of you are interested in participating further in the course, next semester, please just let me know and we'll organize it so that you can be an active participant as we, uh, as we continue. A couple of people have asked me if they could be teaching assistants um, and we've got a slot or two available for that as well. So don't hesitate to be in touch with me about it, okay? I really, really appreciate your, your commitment to this issue, uh, looking how we're living on the planet. So uh, I hope you'll do more of that. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to go through with you. There was an agreement in Durban, South Africa, um, and I think you need to understand what that means. Uh, some people are very, very positive about it. Some environmental activists are less positive about it because nothing really um, legally binding will come into effect until 2020, in other words, eight years from now. Um, and there is fear that um, it's going to be too late. Um, we'll see. Um, there are some, uh, I'm going to weave into this mini lecture, a report, uh, an interview with Nicholas Stern and a couple of other people um, uh, this morning that was on uh, BBC Radio 4 on the Today program, which I always recommend. Uh, so. Um, let me, let me just go through a few things about uh, what happened in Durban. Um, what they did do at Durban was they didn't commit to a treaty per se. They committed to uh, uh, reaching a legally binding agreement. Um, now, what, what are the chances of that uh, proceeding, uh, of, of, of that process succeeding? Um, there's a Q&A uh, that I found that I think um, many of you would find um, particularly interesting. And let me go through that with you, so it, because I think it helps to clarify um, uh, some of the basic issues and make it what happened to Durban clear and also what the future uh, portends. Um, so what happened in, in Durban, Durban? For the first time, world governments uh, committed themselves to write a comprehensive global agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions covering developed and developing countries, which will come into force in 2020. The next question is, um, haven't we had climate change agreements before? Yes, we have, uh, going back to 1992, but never quite like this. The 1997 Kyoto Protocol, which most people know about, is the world's only existing treaty stipulating cuts in greenhouse gas emissions, but the cuts only apply to developed countries, and as probably many of you know, the United States has never joined in. Uh, the current Kyoto targets expire next year, and only the European Union uh, among major developed countries, has agreed to a continuation of them afterwards. Japan, Russia, and Canada, we talked about Canada and the tar sands, and Canada have all 
dropped out of the Kyoto Agreement. Accords were also struck uh, on climate um, in 2009 and 2010 at Copenhagen in Denmark and Cancun in Mexico, respectively. Uh, and by those accords, most countries and all of the biggest economies set out national targets on emissions curbs up to the year 2020. But these are voluntary and not legally binding. Next question. Why is a legally binding treaty important? An international treaty is far harder for future politicians to wriggle out of than commitments at simply a national level. You'll all understand that, I'm sure. They are not impossible to renege on, witness the failure of several Kyoto participants, such as Canada, to meet their targets. But they give an additional level of security which is important for investors looking to pour money into a greening of the economy. That's very important. Next question. Will the new agreement really be legally binding? Well, a last minute compromise at Durban meant the new phase of negotiations about to start should be, quote, a protocol, a legal instrument or an agreed outcome, and here's the key term, with legal force, end quote. The latter, a legal, with an agreed outcome with legal force, is the weakest option, but according to the European Union, it will effectively mean countries are legally bound to meet their emissions uh, quotas. Will this deal stop climate change? That's the next question. Unfortunately, the answer is no. What was discussed at Durban were the principles on which future negotiations will be based. There were no discussions of how far and how fast countries should be cutting their carbon dioxide. Next question, isn't that worrying? Well, yes it is. Emissions have risen by nearly 50% in the past 20 years and they're still going up. With every year of increase, we have much less chance of keeping global temperature rises to less than 2%, 2 degrees centigrade, beyond which, beyond the 2 degrees centigrade limit, scientists say climate change becomes catastrophic and irreversible. Well, there's some, uh, there's some uh, ability to fudge on that, but there is still no question that this is, we're right on the edge of the cliff here, and uh, I'm not sure people are sober enough to uh, not fall over. Well, next question. So what happens next? Governments around the world will begin negotiations on what the new climate agreement should look like. According to the so-called Durban platform, these must wrap up, be finished, in 2015 with a legal document ready to be signed. Governments will then have five years to ratify it. We hope. Final question. What can go wrong with this? Well, the answer is everything. This is a delicate process. And there are powerful national invested interests involved. And it has taken 20 years to get this far. Countries deciding how far and how fast to cut emissions was one of the hardest parts of the process leading up to the Copenhagen summit in 2009. And the pledges declared there were inadequate to the scale of the climate challenge, according to scientists. Although the U.S. has signed up, for, ins for instance, there is no guarantee, and this is really worrying to those of you who are in the United States, and there's work to be done, um, there is no guarantee that if a Republican president, think of Rick Perry, were elected next year, he or she, Michelle Bachman, would not rip up this agreement and refuse to negotiate because they don't really believe climate change is happening. So now let's take a listen to um, the interview that uh, Sarah Montague did with uh, Nicholas Stern this morning on the Today program. 
Uh, and then I'll well, come Lord back to Stern you, uh, joins us so. now from Guildford. He's chair of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment and the Centre for Climate Change Economics and Policy at, L at the LSE. He also wrote a landmark report for the last government on the costs of climate change. Good morning, Lord Stern. Good morning, sir. Uh, they've reached a deal, which everybody seems very happy about, but is it enough, and does it move quickly enough? It doesn't move quickly enough, but it's a significant step forward. It could have been much worse. If things had unraveled in Durban, we would have gone backwards and uh, would have been moving even slower. So it is important, it is significant, but we have to accelerate. But it, it could provide us with the platform for that acceleration. OK, now when we look at the acceleration, what is required, what we're always told is that what we do not want is temperatures to rise two degrees above pre-industrial levels. So this is the 1990 level. If they left it till 2015 to, to sign the deal that didn't come into force till 2020, would that door be closed forever? It would be extremely difficult. It's two degrees centigrade above the 19th century level that uh, we're looking for. And uh, if you go above that, you run the risk of feedbacks like the collapse of the Amazon forest, the thawing of the uh, permafrost, the former losing you a very important carbon sink, and the latter releasing uh, lots of methane. So that's why people talk about uh, two degrees. Because it's irreversible. Because it, starts, it could start off processes which could become irreversible. Um, if we got to three degrees, we would be at temperatures we haven't seen for uh, three million years on this planet. We've been around as uh, humans, homo sapiens, for maybe 200,000 years. So it would take us right outside the range of any human experience. It probably would involve lots of people moving because we are where we are, because of the rivers and the seashores and the ports and the weather and climate and so on. And so it would be very dangerous to let it go um, beyond the two-degree story. Um, the trouble is that we've already accumulated so much greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and we're continuing to add to that at a pretty rapid rate. And that's why delay is dangerous. It's a ratchet effect. Because we limit our room for manoeuvre. We limit our room for manoeuvre because once it's up there, the greenhouse gas is very difficult to get them out, and the later you leave it, the more you lock in the high carbon uh, capital and infrastructure, so it makes change more difficult. Here, so delay is dangerous. Here's the difficulty, though. The politics of this, uh, the United States and China have not been keen to sign up to before. They, what they've effectively agreed to sign up is to negotiations. And uh, some people think that actually this is not the way to go. You can spend years and years trying to get something that replaces Kyoto when actually the best thing to do is for each country to do their own thing, to sort of, in, in a sense, it's that sort of aggressive bilateral approach. Britain says, we're going to do this, what are you going to do? This bottom-up story fits with the top-down of the international agreement. China took on their targets at uh, Copenhagen and confirmed them at Cancun last year, the last such meeting before Durban, in the context of what other people were doing. And now China has translated those targets into the 12th five-year plan, which was adopted in March of this year, and they're getting on with it. It becomes law in uh, China, and it becomes a criteria by which the leadership is judged by the party and the people. So you have this two-way story. If you see international agreements moving along, however staggeringly, in uh, a certain direction, in the direction of tightening up on greenhouse gas emissions, then countries have more confidence that their actions will be uh, useful because others will be moving ahead, and they see the opportunities right. in the new low-carbon revolution. They see this as a big, expanding industrial story. It's industrial revolution. So you, these two things feed well, off each other. Five years ago, you said that if we acted now to do something about climate change, it would cost effectively 1% on GDP for, for global GDP. Uh, you obviously haven't done all the data again, but do you have some sense of what it would cost now, particularly given the situation we're in, if, if we were to, to try to deal with it now? Well, I would think about investment levels. I don't think the cost language it captures all the story, but I think investment levels will probably need to be around 2% uh, extra to embark on this low-carbon industrial revolution. But they would be investments with really lear real learning returns. You discover, you find out new things, just like you do, and we did, in past industrial revolutions and waves of technological change. And they have benefits which 
in terms of energy security, cleaner, quieter, uh, safer way of producing and consuming, and much more biodiverse. So these investments will have to be substantial. I think I would now put them at 2% of GDP because of the delay and because of the increasing danger which the science is pointing to. But we should see them as investments, an exciting journey, and they will have real returns beyond simply the fundamental one of reducing the very severe, immense risks of climate change. I should point out to everybody that uh, Lord Nicholas Stern was uh, charged by the previous British government to do an extended study on the economics of climate change. Uh, it's not a particularly happy report, I have to say. That, that economically it's becoming more and more uh, difficult for us to uh, make the transitions that we need to make. Uh, nonetheless, if you're interested in that, uh, in the resource libraries that we have on the left-hand side of the uh, home page, under Section 8 on our economy, you'll find a video, uh, an extended video interview with uh, Nicholas Stern called The Economics of Climate Change. It's a talk that he gave, as I recall, at the London School of Economics uh, shortly after they issued the report. So you might take a look at that. Um, again, um, thanks for all of your involvement this semester. I hope all of you have a, a very uh, uh, happy holiday period, uh, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever it is that you celebrate, um, or even those of you who might be pagans, um, uh, who are going to celebrate the winter solstice I hope you have a great time and uh, best wishes for the uh, new year. Uh, please do be in touch. Um, I love hearing from you. And uh, if there's any further information I can give to any of you, please let me know. All the best.